Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Jose Andres is a James Beard award winning chef, a Michelin starred restaurateur, and now a New York Times best selling author. I'm Malika Bilal, and today Chef Andres joins us to discuss his new book about providing meals and disaster relief to Puerto Rico and beyond. Have a question for him? Leave it in the YouTube chat, and we'll get them into the conversation. My name is Sonia Balentine. I am a Cree filmmaker and writer from Northern Manitoba, and you are in the stream. Jose Andres didn't want to just give food to people recovering from the impact of Hurricane Maria. He wanted to give the best food. In his new book, We Fed an Island, the true story of rebuilding Puerto Rico one meal at a time, he recounts the struggle of trying to provide aid to a U.S. territory ravaged by a hurricane and entangled in bureaucratic red tape. Andreas founded the World Central Kitchen in 2010 after an earthquake rocked Haiti, using his contacts to secure resources for the devastated nation. But in Puerto Rico, he found himself frequently at odds with some U.S. government institutions that, to him, seemed more concerned with playing politics than helping the island's more than three million residents. So the stream is delighted to have in the studio Chef Jose Andres. Chef, welcome. Thank you for having me. I have seen you in action so many times on video, on stills, and when you look the happiest, most at ease is when you are feeding people, and particularly little people. So I have a little person here on my laptop screen. This is you in Puerto Rico, and the little kids are loving what they're eating. Thumbs up. What is it that food does that nothing else can do in, in a situation like that, a disaster? Chefs like me, we love to feed the few, but I believe we even love more to feed the many. Mm. And I think it was a French philosopher, uh, Briat Sauran, that in 1826 said, tell me what you eat and I will tell you who you are. Ah. Food is an extension of who we are, of our DNA, where we come from. The people that had an influence in our lives, our grandmother, our father, uh, we, we are food. And I don't think anybody is uh, any happier than in a table with people you love or total strangers mm -hmm. sharing a humble plate of food. I think that is what people respect in you. I, uh, this is just one of them. This is Claude, who writes on Twitter, I respect Chef Andres in so many ways. First of all, for what he's done in the culinary world, more importantly, what he does in feeding the needy. As a chef myself, we're driven by the love of feeding people, so I admire his passion for helping others at their most vulnerable time. I want to use that tweet, though, to talk about why you got into this industry in the first place. Well, um... Food business, I think, uh, for me was a natural. Uh, my father, my mother, they always cook at home uh, because necessity. They, we, we, I grew up in a middle class family, but it's not like we will go to a restaurant every day, not at all. Going to a restaurant was really a special occasion. Going to the market every day and buying the bread, the fish, or the vegetables was what we did. So cooking at home for me was great. So watching my mom and my dad really had this influence in me. Uh, in my brothers, but I think many people, not only in Spain, but anywhere around the world, mm -hmm. just watching our family members feeding us when we were children, it's probably some of the best memories we bring with us when we leave home. So I think I, I own that to my father, to my mother, the many times that even they were working hard, they will always make sure that we had a great plate of food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When you talk about cooking, there's a whole different level of cooking that you now have, have hit. You have 30 restaurants. Uh, you've had a couple of TV series. You have a New York Times best-selling book right here. How did you get from loving your parents' cooking to the chef that you are today where people respect you? And we're not even talking about the activism yet and the humanitarian work that you're doing, but just a first-class chef. Well, I think uh, just one plate at a time. Uh, my father always put me cooking when I was young, but not cooking itself, but making the fire, gathering the wood in the forest, uh -huh. helping him make the fire, and he will cook a very big paella, the traditional rice dish from Spain. Uh -huh. One day I got upset because I wanted to do the cooking. My father sent me away. He said, no, I need you to do the fire. I don't want to. Go away. Leave me alone. When we finish, I'll talk to you. When everybody ate the paella without my help, my father got me on the side. I probably was 14th. 
and told me, my son, I know you wanted to do the cooking, but actually you were doing the most important thing, mm -hmm. which was controlling the fire, making the fire. Once you are able to control the fire and learn your fire, then you can do any cooking you want. Mm -hmm. This is something you can use, obviously, for cooking, but also you can bring this to real life. We all need to learn our fire, uh -huh. control it, and then we can do any cooking we want. I think that lesson that my father somehow uh, taught me over the years, it served me well. I think I've been always trying to, to, to understand my fire so I could do many things that go beyond what on paper a cook is supposed to, to do. You know, one of my favorite things about this show so far, and we're only a few minutes in, is that we are hearing from people who are inspired by your work, but also people who have worked with you and are still inspired, which I think says a lot about a person. So I want to play a video comment we got from Owen Thompson. He's the owner of a bar here in Washington, D.C., and here's what he said about working with Chef Andres. I, like so many people in the D.C. restaurant business, had the pleasure of working for Jose. I was his beverage director for a few years, and... You know, it really shaped the way that I look at running my own restaurant now. You know, the, the care that they put into every little piece and decision and, and all the factors that can be involved. Uh, I've, I've really greatly enjoyed watching him take his passion out into the world and, and do things for, you know, humanitarian relief, uh, you know, foray into politics, all this stuff. And it's just, it's just great to see that, that level of passion he has just being used in all these different ways. So high praise there. You look uncomfortable with the praise, but I, I, like, the, the, I like the fact that he says you, you, you've not only taken the passion in the kitchen and, 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 and inspired clearly the people you work with, but you've taken it outside the kitchen. Well, I didn't know it was going to be such a personal right. uh, kind of people <laughs> coming. Uh, that's beautiful. I, I, love, I love Owen. Mm -hmm. Uh, he is the reason uh, I have the restaurants I have. Mm. Many men and women like him over the years. We are only as good as the people we have around us. If we feel we are I the person, we're in the wrong business. Not in cooking, in any business in life. Uh, we the people is what I love really about America. And the world believes in we the people. We are always stronger. The only thing Owen didn't learn from me is that he says work for me. Mm. He never worked for me. He were with me, I were with him. Mm -hmm. We all work with each other. We are only gonna be better if we believe in that simple connection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love that he helped me. I hope I, I gave him a, a way to keep moving forward. And I love that now many of them leave and they become their, their captains uh, in their own business. And that's what life should be all about. Chef, I wanted to take our audience back to last year uh, when Hurricane Maria went through Puerto Rico and you, got on a plane and went to help. Everybody else was trying to get off the island, you were trying to get on the island, and this is four days after you got there, this is what you were doing. Have a look at this video, everybody. Uh, back there we have the paellas, let me show you. Here the trucks come to pick up the food and be delivered to the different communities. Here we have the paellas, we have three paellas going. Um, um, Rice with chicken, Chef Manolo, one of the, the legendary chefs here in the island, really doing food with whatever we have. And then we have these amazing food operations, that is the food trucks, that we are sending them into the community. Say hi. Hello. To deliver to different ejidas, which are the... Four days in, you turn up, uh, I'm not, you didn't even have a satellite phone, you had very little, and you know what you are doing. How is it that a chef who runs 30-odd restaurants gets on the ground in a hurricane situation and knows what they're doing? Explain. Well, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 49 years old already. <laughs> I've been in a few hurricanes before. Uh -huh. uh, but always doing what everybody does, trying to, to do your part to help others. In my case, I'm a cook trying to feed people. So... I've been through different hurricanes before. And I always went with the idea of learning. And in the process, feeding people. But I guess the learning should pay off. And when I arrived for Rico, really, uh, the problem was massive. We are not only talking about uh, a beach town or city, but we're talking about the entire island. 
that during 18th hours was damaged by very big Hurricane Maria. So we saw the problem was big. We saw the hospitals had no food, nurses, doctors. We began getting phone calls from many of them. So we began responding to their, to their phone calls. Why was no restaurants? Was no, was no, 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 no food delivery, was no money, was no cell, cell phone. You couldn't connect to the internet. Mm. Uh, and the problem didn't seem that was going to end anytime soon. So usually we began cooking to respond to those calls of aid for water, for food. What I didn't know that the, this was only the beginning of, uh, of a very big adventure. We went from 20 friends that we met in Jose Enrique, my friend, but also the name of a restaurant I love, in the heart of San Juan. Uh, we did 1,000 meals that first day, Monday. Whatever Jose Enrique had in the refrigerator and other restaurants that kind of gave us what they had in their freezer before everything went, went bad. And from 20 people, we ended being an army of 25,000 amazing women and men Puerto Rican. We went from one restaurant to, at one point, 18th restaurants functioning at the same time, 18th kitchens all across the island. We opened a total of 26. We had 10 food trucks. We went from 1,000 meals the first day to more than 3.7 million in a matter of weeks. And we didn't do it alone. I didn't do it alone. We got a lot of help from a lot of great people. Not only the amazing men and women of Puerto Rico, many of them children, uh, but military helpers because they were seeing what we were doing. So Humvees from the army, uh, helicopters from private companies like Goya or uh, the Air Force, or boats from the Navy, or uh, National Guard that they will volunteer in some of our kitchens. At the end, what happens is when you have a problem and it's very big, you can do two things. You can start planning and keep planning until you think you're ready, or you can start cooking, start covering the immediate needs in an emergency, and in the process, somehow, the plan writes itself. That's what we did. A very big problem. We kind of resolved it by one meal at a time. That ended being more than 3.7 million meals. Mm. It's incredible, and it is detailed in this book we've read, An Island, a better community here is uh, talking about. Jennifer Rodriguez on Twitter says, We Fed an Island is an incredible story of persistence and love on the part of Chef Andres. What stood out to me were the numerous roadblocks, real and metaphorical, that he refused to accept. So my question, what roadblocks does he continue to encounter? And it's funny that she, she puts it lightly, but you name names and oh. you call out the inefficiencies we, in this book all over the place. Uh, we, we call inefficiencies, we call people out, and we call organizations. But I really try to do it with the most respect. But the truth is that if you are an organization, government, nonprofit, that your role is to respond on an emergency. This happens in America or can happen in any other country around the world. What you need to be making sure is that those organizations that we all support are there to fulfill what they claim. If you have NGOs that they are requesting for our donations, that's very okay. We will support you. But when there is time to respond, cannot be an excuse of why we are not there to help the people. The same with government agencies. If they are there to give support to their citizens, cannot be excuse of why it doesn't happen. Sure, so let me, let me this share. has to be very clear. In any country, not in America, in any country around the world, our governments and the big NGOs should be there to take care of the people, especially in emergencies. You're being diplomatic now that you weren't quite so diplomatic at the time. So this is you tweeting out to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So whenever there's trouble, they go places in America. You, you tweet to them, uh, at WC Kitchen, your organization, has a great operation producing hot meals with local ingredients, able to reach 250,000 a day. Why don't you support us? You are calling them out on Twitter around the world because 
what you wanted to do, they didn't want to do. Or they wanted to give you uh, a contract that you had to bid for and you were thinking, I have to feed people right now. They weren't doing it on your timetable and you felt you knew better. And I can't work out whether you were a troublemaker or the person coming to help Puerto Rico. It's a fine line. What were you doing? It's a very fine line and I totally, uh, uh, if I was running FEMA, I will yeah. probably go through the same thinking process. Mm -hmm. But the issue at hand was this. Number one, the men and women that work not only in FEMA, but first responders in America and all around the world to me, they're all heroes because really they spend long hours, long days, long weeks away from their families taking care of others. But, but, if you're an organization that should be there in an emergency to take care of people, and we're talking about hungry people and thirsty people, you have to be providing the aid now. The emergency is not a week from now, a month from now, six months from now, when you have American people hungry or any other citizen of the world hungry. The emergency is now. If you are not responding now, it's not good enough. I saw people drinking from dirty streams water, people that got sick and who knows what else. I saw women falling down because they had good sweet water to be drinking, people that were g gathering roots and boiling them as their only source of food. This is America, Puerto Rico, in the 21st century. So at the end, they call it contract. It was not Jose Andres. This was an NGO called Wall Central Kitchen, a 501c3 register with the simple thing of bringing food solutions. We were there with a solution. I didn't even want them. But you were tiny. You were so tiny. You're like, who is this guy? He's the guy off the TV. I understand. But at the same time, I was not talking. By the time I was pushing for this, we were already doing uh -huh. 10, 20,000 meals a day, 30,000 meals a day. At one point, we began almost uh, increasing uh, 50, 100, 250,000 dollars a day. At the end, when we talk about the federal government, the federal government is there to provide aid to the people. And that means in the form of money for everything, electricity, all the many needs that you have. At the end, I didn't really want it, money. What I wanted was for them to endorse the plan and for them to follow the guidelines of the plan I put in front of them. Your plan. In a map. Because it was a good plan. The plan of the people. Right. At the end, if you have to be bringing food from somewhere else, yeah. but the food is available in the island, why we don't start activating the businesses that are already in the island and in the process of providing emergency aid, you help the island come back. That's what needs to be happening in the world. All the big organizations in the world, they need to start learning when these emergencies happen, they need to be helping the people that they are trying to, to bring relief. But in the process, they need to start bringing the economy back creating jobs, buying from the local farmers, opening restaurants or bakeries. That's a new form of food aid or relief in the 21st century. In the process of helping the people, make sure that you are not bringing their economies down, but empower their economies to prosper and to be more efficient. So when they move away from the emergency, already you are leaving the citizens in a very good situation. Chef, I want to share a couple of comments uh, from people who you worked with to help the people of Puerto Rico. This is Jenny. She is an attorney in San Juan, and this is what she told the stream. As Jose arrived to our location, he started assigning tasks to everyone there. He said that he wanted us Puerto Ricans to own it, and we stepped up immediately. Jose's presence in Puerto Rico was furthermore than a feeding operation. It was a lesson of love, of working collectively for one purpose. What Jose and his team of volunteers achieved in so short time inspired many to come every day and just make it happen. We fed Puerto Rico. But she's not the only one. I want to share a couple of tweets. This is from Mario, also a chef in uh, Puerto Rico. He says, your World Central Kitchen is still supporting farmers, and they've done an amazing effort on recovery on small farms. Everyone thought he left, but not everyone knows he's still here and he's not leaving. And thanks to him, now all my restaurants have a plan to help out our community in case of another disaster. We're already 95% back to normal. 
Well, the first woman uh, I recognize is Jeannie. Mm -hmm. She joined us very early on. Mm -hmm. And she, like many other women, uh, Erin Schroeder, who was our uh, self-elected director of operations for the entire enterprise, between her and Jeannie very much, were the two people that moved the operation forward. Mm -hmm. Jeannie will be in charge of many things. She knew the island very well. She had a lot of connections. And she will be like the order taker. Mm -hmm. And she will be the one making sure that we reach, at, at times, almost 900 delivery points a day all across the island. Mm -hmm. uh, we had many women that they helped us really lead this operation. So Jeannie, quite frankly, she did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. She worked probably 24-7 for many days, weeks, nonstop. And, and in part, World Central Kitchen succeeded because she was a hero, like many other people mm -hmm. that joined her and others. Uh, Mario was one of the, of the many amazing chefs of Puerto Rico that helped us. Mario early on uh, helped us use with food from Goya, good contacts he had. Uh, everybody helped in the best way it could. Some people cooking, some people with helicopters, connections, some people with donations, some fresh fruit that people really were in need of. Uh, with so many ways that everybody found always a way to be part of the team doing what they could do best. Mm -hmm. And that's what World Central Kitchen sometimes succeed. We are a very small organization, but very quickly, like almost we were the American National Guard, mm -hmm. that when there something happens, they are right. called to service. Mm -hmm. This is the same. We are a small organization, but when we need people, we have an amazing way that everybody arrives and everybody is able to contribute with the best they have to give to us. You love Twitter. Twitter is a tool for you. Tool for information <laughs> and Facebook and video. So you've got it all there. If you look on uh, Chef Jose Andres's uh, Twitter page, you will actually see him. Are you tweeting in, with that phone in your hand? What is going on there? You are, you are using social media. Um, you had a fight as you were doing this, as you were feeding with your fellow chefs, with Puerto Ricans. You were feeding the island. Uh, you're, having a, you're having a tiff with the president. Uh, if I was at real Donald Trump, I would be in Puerto Rico to leave no more than two days after disaster. Uh, one suggestion. If I was at real Donald Trump, I would not attack a leader that has worked nonstop for her people. More advice about giving gas to bigger bakeries fully functioning so their trucks can deliver bread. The advice goes on and on. I would praise the volunteers. You are very vocal. You and Donald Trump have a definite relationship by the end of the whole Puerto Rico crisis. And then the, finally, the one is read this book. Read this book because this is advice for you and for uh, NGOs and other organizations. I'm wondering if in here, this is a model for not how food aid could be improved, but all aid, all disaster aid, think in a different way. Well, number one, I, I, I never had a fight with anybody in my entire life. Okay. But yes, I'm very vocal and I think part of democracy is that we are all vocal, with uh -huh. respect, but vocal. Sure. Uh, um, at the times, uh, uh, I wish that the restaurant I was supposed to open, uh, the, the Trump Hotel here in Washington, D.C., mm. I wish I did open it, because maybe I will be closer to him. And maybe I could be asking him in first person, Sir. And just very, very briefly, because we've got a minute left, you didn't open that restaurant because? Because uh, his comments about immigra immigrants and Mexicans as okay. rapists and other things. Mm. But sometimes I dream. I had mm. this Red Mark connection because the people of Puerto Rico were in need of leadership. Sure. Leadership is 51% empathy, yeah. and sometimes only showing up. So yes, we were failing, not because it was Donald Trump the person, but because the government was failing. And if you're the president, you are in charge of the government. So who I'm gonna be asking but the president of the United States? Mm -hmm. We failed the people of Puerto Rico. I do believe this book shows ways, but the most important thing is stop, is stop meeting. Just start cooking. And that's sometimes the best plan. I want to end with a comment from uh, David Dutton uh, from North Carolina, where you were the latest storm. Here's what he told the stream. Chef Andreas, I just really want to let you know how much uh, we still think about you in Pender County, North Carolina, and all the things you did for us that day and those days after the storm. During those days after, you know, we were we were always looking forward to the end of the day when we know your team was coming because um, these things were, were amazing for us. These were five-star meals. They uh, weren't just... Ending on some praise know, for boys. Chef Jose Andres. Thank you very much for being with us Thank on the stream. Guys. We really enjoyed your company. Thank you very much.